Okay, so whenever we are talking about the vector cultures, so we would like to know what are the viable cells. Because our motto will be to culture the vector cells. So if we are aware that what is the number of cells which can be cultured or which will be growing, so for that we use viable counting methods. So these methods they count only those cells that are able to reproduce and then culture. So there are two methods. One is the spread plate methods, and the second one is the core plate methods. So the original number of viable microorganisms in this sample can be calculated from the number of colonies found and the sample diet. So let's say for example, if one ml of one into ten to six dilution yield one fifty colonies. Then we are culturing on a agar plate. The original sample contains 1.5 to 10 to the power 8 cells per ml. It's a simple 1.5 right here, 2 will be going there. So 1.5 to 10 to cells per ml. So, so this we have another thing which is called the membrane filter technique. So what usually is done that aquatic samples they pass through black polycarbonate membrane filters. So this is usually done in the cases where the microorganisms is very low. So in those samples where the number is large, we just take them spread onto the plate and we get a column. But here, what we do is we pass this through a membrane. So this is a typical depiction of that. So this is what we have membrane. This is the filtration assembly. So one head that sample onto the top. And this is passed through this particular assembly. So this particular membrane is then taken off. And now this membrane has a concentration of those microorganisms. So, <clears throat> so what we do is add, we take those microorganisms, this pass to the surface of this membrane and put it on the other plate and incubate it for 24 hours. So we see typical organisms. So this is a typical representation of a couple of colonies. So these are the colonies which are growing on a standard nutrient media. And these are on the fecal coliform media and these are on the port of the culture of yeast and world. So now one can see that on different media, the same sample was printed and put on to different media, we we'll see growth of different micro organisms. So what it means that in that particular sample, in that particular water, we have a mixture of different kind of microorganisms. And now, if we want to have pure culture, we can just pick up any of these small box, small colonies, and add it to a fresh media. So there will be doubling, and then we we'll get pure cultures. So there are a couple of advantages associated with the plating techniques. They are simple, sensitive, and widely used for viable counting of the So both the core plate and the another one that spread plate. So these two techniques they can be easily used. So usually these kind of techniques they are used for food, water, and soil samples. So there it's a little easy to get the sample and just pour it. Power. So, no counts will result if clump of cells are not broken and the microorganisms are not well dispersed. So, this is one drawback of this technique, plating technique. Why? Because if there is clumps of the bacterium, they'll just grow as single colony. So, if those clumps are not broken, then we will not get the exact colony. So, what we need to do is, do is that we need to break those things, those clumping of bacteria. So, since it is not possible to be certain that each colony will form an individual cell, so usually we are just taking samples, we are not all the time visualizing under the microscope, or you cannot make it sure that those microorganisms are separated. And those colonies which are arising from those are from only a single cell. So, now we use a, another term which is called the colony forming unit, in short, we call CFUs. So, in place of giving the number of bacteria, we say these are the colony forming units. So, a sample should have between 30 to 300 colonies for most accurate count. So, there is another problem, problem with this whole 
split technique that if you are using hot and dark, so it may injure or kill the sensitive cells. So remember this NR it can be heated up to 90 degrees. So when it is heated to 90 degrees and you are pouring it, so it is quite possible that those bacteria which are into or if you know, added to that particular media may die. So now is the second approach that is the measurement of cell mass. So direct approach is the determination of microbial dry weight. Now there's a problem with the microbial dry weight is that it's a little bit difficult to get. So what we have to do, we have to do a couple of studies, a couple of experiments before getting the bacterial weight. This is really small, this is micro and milligram. So what one has to do is that one has to take the liquid media where the cells are grown. It needs to be centrifuged. So after centrifugation, one gets a pellet. So that needs to be washed and dried in a hot water. So once you get the dry weight, then you can weigh it. So after weighing that, one gets the exact weight. So previous and the final one. So from the weight, you can calculate, okay, this is the growth. So this is usually a technique for growth of filamentous fungi. So these fungi, they can weigh, they can stand that centrifugation as well as the heat. So now this comes another technique which is called spectrophotometry. So usually microbes when they are in culture and the light strikes them, they scatter the light. So the amount of scattering is directly proportional to the biomass of cells present and indirectly related to the cell number. So let's say if we have a concentration of bacteria that reaches 10 raised to power 6 cells per ml, the medium appears slightly cloudy or dark. So initially, the medium is clear and the population is about a million, it is cloudy or dark. So now if we take the absorbance, then we can differentiate from the initial to the final one. Now one thing that one needs to remember is that absorbance has to be less than 0.5. Then we get the linear. If it is more than 0.5, then there's a problem. The linearity goes. So now we come to another thing. So we call it continuous culture system. So Previous one was a kind of low system where we are taking a vessel, mutant media was at a temperature was maintained and the bacteria was growing. So after a certain time point, the bacteria growth ceases. It comes to stationary phase and ultimately it starts dying because of the accumulation of the toxic products. So just to avoid that, we can use another strategy which is continuous culture system. So in this, microorganisms are grown in a system with constant environmental conditions maintained through continual provision of nutrients and removal of waste. So we are continuously feeding in nutrients and waste products are being removed. So these systems can maintain a micro population and exponential growth for extended periods. So, you know, if the nutrient is continuously provided, then the exponential phase of microbes can be extended for longer duration. So ultimately, you know, the temperature, the availability of nutrients is provided, so the bacteria will keep on growing. And also the toxic product is removed. So this kind of continuous culture we are using food and industrial microbiology. So now we can have two major types of continuous culture system. Number one is the chemostat, another is the turbido stats. So this is a typical construction of a chemostat. So there is a big jar, there is a fresh media. So that is why a control wall attached to the culture vessel. So from here you can control the flow rate of the fresh medium. And then we have the inlet for the air supply also. So that air supply tube is tipped into the culture medium and as and when required, the air supply is taken. So 
we have our air pumped oxygen. And this tube is connected to a overflow receptacle also. So now one can control the flow rate of fresh media using this wall. And as the level increases, it will automatically take into the outside. So depending on what is the flow rate, the media will be automatically removed. So in a way, fresh media which contains fresh nutrients is keep on hitting and the new media was being in the culture vessel and it was having accumulation of toxic it could be relieved could be escaped from the particular vessel so the rate at which the sterile media is fed into the culture vessel is the same as the rate of which the media containing microorganism is removed so depending on this how much is added this will automatically be taken off so the growth is determined by the rate at which new medium is fed into the growth chamber. So this D is the dilution rate, F is the flow rate and B is the vessel volume. So from this particular the rate at which the medium flows into the culture vessel relative to the vessel volume. Okay, so another one is the orbital step. So orbital step is as a photocell that measures the turbidity of the culture in the core vessel. So now depending on how turbid that particular media is, it will automatically regulate the growth or sorry addition of the fresh media. So this is a kind of more automated system. So as the bacterial growth let's say it increases to a value of 0 0.5, 0 0.4, so we can set. So let's say we want a 0 0.5 so when this media reaches 0.5, it will automatically remove some media and add a pressure. As we already know that turbid is related to cell density. So dilution rate in a turbid state varies rather than remaining constant. So it's almost like an air conditioner. So as air conditioner, we set a temperature of 25 degrees, let's say. So when the temperature reaches above 25, it's switched on. And after it's on for a couple of minutes, then again it brings temperature to 25, then it will be switched on. A similar kind of thing is happening in the turbid step. So as it reaches that particular, crosses that particular limit that we have set, it will start adding fresh media. When this is again working normal, it will start. So turbid state operates best at high dilution rates. And the chemo state is most stable effective at Lower dilution rates. So this is a kind of difference between both the systems. Okay, so after this, we'll talk about the influence of environmental factors on growth. So, as all of us know, the microorganisms they are being influenced by the environmental condition, their growth, their reproduction, the overall metabolism is influenced by the environmental factors. So, here introduces a word which is called the extremophiles. So these are the microorganisms that grow in harsh conditions. So as all of us know, microbes, they are found in everywhere, at any temperature, at, at any height. So this example of Bacillus infernus. So they can live at 2.4 kilometers below Earth surface without oxygen and a temperature of about 60 degrees. So, this particular is an example of external files and it's not only that, there are several thousands of bacteria, microorganisms which are thriving at very dry or very warm conditions or in absence of oxygen. So look at this particular table here. So depending on the micro response to the environmental factors, the microorganisms they are labeled. So first one is the depending on the solute and water activity. So we have this osmotolerant. So they are able to grow over a wide range of water activity or osmotic concentration. So as you might have done the experiment with the blood cells where we will maintain the hypertonic, hypotonic and isotonic solution. So until as this isotonic solution here, the RBC will either shrink or their volume will increase. However, if we have this phosphotolerant bacteria, they will be stable at a high range of osmotic concentration. For example, is Staph aureus 
and the Saccharomyces boxing. Now comes the halophile. So usually high levels of sodium chloride are usually 0.2 mole. So these organisms they are tolerant to tolerant to high salt conditions. For example, hello the kid. So now depending on the pH, we can have acidophile, neutrophile, or acidophile. So as evident from the name, acidophile means they are going in acidic condition from 0 to 5.5. Neutrophile they are usually 5.5 to so that's the growth range. Alkalophiles they are usually from 8 to 11. There are examples of this. Then we have a depending on the temperature. So temperature either we can have psychrophile, psychrotroph, mesophile, thermophile, and hyperthermal. So psychrophile they grow at zero degrees and from zero to fifteen or more. Psychrotrophs they are okay, they can grow from zero to seven degrees. Their optimum will be twenty to thirty. Mesophiles they are usually twenty to forty five. Thermophiles, they are above 50, 55 to 65. Mm -hmm. Hyperthermophiles, they are 80 to 150 degrees. So you can see this is really high temperature, and still we have a couple of examples of this. Now, depending on the oxygen, again, we have these five different kinds of microorganisms. So obligate, facultative, androps, aerotolerant, androps, obligate, androps, and microorganisms. So, obligate aerosols they need atmospheric oxygen for their growth. Facultative, they do not require oxygen for growth, but grows better in this case. They may, you know, they can survive without oxygen also, but if available, they are better. Aerotolerant, they grow equally well in both. Oxygenability may be or may not, it doesn't matter. Then, obligate and growth, they don't need oxygen at all. They grow in absence of oxygen. If given, they will die. Then micro aerophile, they require oxygen levels 2 to 10 percent for growth and is damaged by the atmosphere. So, that must be about 20 percent. So, they need smaller. Now, the last one is barophile. So, these barophiles they grow more rapidly at high hydrostatic pressures. For example, photobacterium profundus and Schwannella melting. So, these are kind of organisms which need high pressures for their growth. Okay, so the microbial environment is complex and constantly changing. So, this all of us we are aware that they are growing in nutrient deficient conditions and the environment is continuously changing. Let's say if we talk about community growing in a pond. So, in pond, the constraints keep on changing. So, as the constraint is changing depending on the water content. So, we can say that this is a complex as well as changing. So, it often contains low nutrient conditions and exposes microbes to many overlapping gradients of nutrients and other environmental factors. So, in that particular pond, it's not only that the nutrients are less, they are exposed to other nutrients also. Let's say for our household waste is going to different waste pools. So different ponds and those kind of collection water bodies they are formed. So in those water bodies, there are microorganisms which are getting nutrient deficient as well as they are getting different kind of toxic chemicals as well. The growth of microorganisms depend on both the nutrient supply and their tolerance to the environmental condition. So they will have to not only thrive in the conditions which are nutrient deficient, but they also need to survive those toxic environmental conditions. So, both the availability of the nutrient as well as the toxic products, they are the great limiting factors for their growth. So, they need to combat, they need to supplement both the great limiting factors. So now I would like to introduce another term which is called the biofilms. So biofilms they are slime encased communities where microbes they are attached and they grow. So biofilms they are kind of ubiquitous in nature. You will find them everywhere. So the molecules they usually form one. 
the microorganisms they form biofilms on virtually any surface. So once it has been conditioned by proteins and other molecules present in the environment. So let's say for example, different kind of joint replacement they have metal there. So those which are let's say a knee joint, so their ball and socket kind of joint is being replaced and that metal. Now different kind of bacteria they could form a thin, thin layer onto that metal part. That is called the biofilm. You usually see that this biofilm is formed at different surfaces as well. So dental plaques, uh, different metal parts which are known to use these joints and all those. So this biofilm, why the organisms form biofilm? So organisms they form biofilm in order to survive. So what is biofilm is that microorganisms when they are growing, they release some exopolysaccharides, we call it EPS. So these exopolysaccharides, they form the mesh-like structure. So that mesh-like structure, it allows the binding of different microbes of the same community of course. So those microbes, they bound to that surface and they start growing. And these membranes or these biofilms, they are virtually non penetrable to the and even the antibiotics. So once a biofilm forms, the bacteria inside it, they are safe and sound. They are not killed by the water flow. They are not killed by the antibiotics. So you can see that this biofilm is a strategy that the bacteria or different kind of microorganisms had developed in order to thrive, in order to survive. So this is a typical representation of the mechanism of formation of biofilm. So let's have a look at this. So initially, the substrate now preconditioning of the ambient molecule. So let's say there is a surface where there could be attachment of some kind of proteins. So when there is some kind of proteins attachment, now there will be a position of bacteria. So those bacteria will be attached to the surface. They will kind of form a uniform layer. Now there are things that either they can keep on persisting or they can be dissolved. So let's say initially, you know, they could be dissolved just by let's say, let's say we talk about uh, any surfaces, metallic surfaces, dental plaques. So they could be kind of cleaned by brushing or using different kind of mouthwash. So those bacteria they will be cleaned off. And if not, then these bacteria, they kind of secrete molecules, they are called as signaling molecules, they are kind of exopolysaccharides. So now these bacteria, they kind of keep on secreting and they will form the layer kind of thing. So there, they will form a connective and diffusive transfer of oxygen nutrients. So there will be diffusion of nutrients in and out. They will need the nutrient and toxic products will be diffused out. So they will have a replication and growth and there will be more and more secretion of these exopolysaccharides. And if it is too much, then there could be detachment or benefits. So in a way, this kind of, you know, initially there was just attachment of two bacteria. And now you can see there is a whole bunch of bacteria, a whole thin layer, film kind of structure is. So that allows the bacteria to thrive. Even some of the antibiotics they cannot penetrate. So the best strategy is to prevent those biofilm formation. So these kind of biofilm formation they can be found on surfaces which are exposed to water. Let's say the surface of the ship, boats, or even the pipelines. So and also in the body, different body organs, even in teeth and those skin surfaces they can be found. So these bacteria, they keep on thriving, they keep on developing new and new strategies to survive. So this is all that I want to talk to you in this particular topic. So thank you very much. And probably I'll stop all this like share and